Okay. How are we on time? We, we lost a few minutes on the setup there. That's okay. That is quite okay. Right on. All right. So we're all set then? Yeah. I am completely blown away that anyone would come and see a talk that they didn't even know was happening an hour ago because I didn't know it was happening an hour ago. Yet somehow, either the other speaker was really boring, I mean, I hope not, whoever you are, you're probably awesome and we wish we were seeing you. Uh, either the other speaker wasn't as fun or you heard I was going to say a few things about guns, which I sometimes do. But either way, I'm glad you're here. And this all started because, well, it started because not a con's fun and I always want to come. But it also kind of started when we were regging and there were some people who couldn't make it this time of day, travel was slowed up, and Froggy and Tiger were like, ugh, and I was like, hey, and they were like, yeah, and that's kind of, you know, <laughs> that was the extent of planning that went into this talk. If you want to go one more level, one level out, you know, Inception style with the kick, I guess, a few days ago with all of the legislation that was going on and the Twitters always explode whenever guns are, are happening, and I was talking about it, and someone said, oh, man, you know, the legislation failed. And I said, oh, this, oh, that. And a lot of people liked it. A lot of people didn't. And someone said, oh, wait, you, you weren't in favor of that? And I said, no, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of glad the legislation didn't carry. And they, oh, how could you? How could you is the reaction. You know, you get that a lot. And instantly I've learned. I've said, look, this, is, this answer is not 140 characters. This is going to be something I will try to take up in a blog post so I had some thoughts, I had some notes that I was just kind of pecking at in the car as we drove here from PA, and instead of it being a blog post, it kind of turned into a talk. And that's why I hope to give you a little bit of where my thoughts have been the past few days, but more than that, I want to know where your thoughts have been and where your thoughts might go. So, hard truths and straight talk coming from a place of love. And a, a pretty wide net I cast with that place of love. One of the things you'll see me keep hitting on here is that you don't want to think in very exclusionary terms, and if we're ever going to get past yelling at each other in 140 characters or less, it's going to involve a lot of people willing to listen to people they normally wouldn't consider listening to. And hopefully, you'll get an idea about that, starting with this. The recent, how many people were following the recent you know, gun legislation that was being debated and amendments being hung on it and being pushed and this and that? And it got, there's been a lot going on in the news that kind of drowned. Like, I think this got pushed to the lifestyle section in some papers after the awful tragedy in Boston. But when this did not carry in the Senate, I was actually, you know, on my Twitter looking at it live happening, and I was watching the Senate legislation die here. I was in an auditorium at the University of Pennsylvania at an event called Finding Common Ground, listening to a panel of anti-gun voices. And I was proud to be there that day. If you don't know who these people are, this is, I'm going to, the, the gentleman's names, I don't remember all of them, but we have someone who just moved from CNN to the new Al Jazeera America network. We have one of the survivors from Virginia Tech who was the focus of a film, I'm sorry, was he Virginia? He was Virginia Tech, the focus of a film about the shootings that day and talking about gun laws. We have Dr. Miller, a statistician, talking all about just how bad guns are from a numbers perspective, according to him. Anyone, you might recognize, blur, blurry photo from my phone, anyone recognize on the far right who that is? That's Captain Kelly. That's Gabby Gifford's husband, doing his Bad Guns Across America tour. And he was the most level-headed voice on this panel. So you can get the idea of the kind of room I was sitting in when he talked about how his home state of Arizona is, you know, starting to allow guns that police confiscate from, you know, like, this was an illegal gun, it could be sold back to the public. The entire room like audibly gasped. They were astounded. So that was the room I was in. Yes? Uh, I don't understand what the big deal about this is because the police department nationwide has been doing exactly that for years, except that normally like large city police departments like Chicago and New York will sell to dealers. Yeah. Yeah, Nightshade points out this is nothing new. And as someone on Twitter said, I wonder how they feel about auto auctions. Like... So, but that was, that was the tenor of the room. Uh, yes, Dr. Bear. I went to a uh, police auction where they sold a uh, volcano vaporizer. Really? <laughs> so selling a volcano vaporizer is okay? Andy Grow Lights from the Grow House. Awesome. <laughs> well, I support all of that. I support selling the old cars. I support, support selling the drug paraphernalia and the guns. But, I mean, this was, this was the room where I was. And I wasn't there 
to kind of stand up and be like, yeah, bitches, y'all got smacked down in the Senate. I really was there because this is something I've been doing for the past couple years. I've been trying to find every you know, anti-gun event I can find. I've been trying to find every we need to change what's wrong with America and guns sure are the problem event that I can find. Because if you're not there, if you like guns and you're not going to these events, you're really just one other jag off on Twitter yelling at each other. And you make all of these people at these events equally worthless because they're a bunch of people just sucking each other off and really not saying anything outside of their own echo chamber. Get outside of your echo chamber or else you are really not part of the solution. You're not part of the problem. The problem isn't us as a community. It's not guns. It's not gun owners. But there is a problem, and you are not part of the fucking solution at all if you're sitting at home talking to people who agree with you about all the things you agree about. Hard truths. I'm going to just bang through them and kind of piss and moan a little bit and say fuck a lot. Because that's my style. I wanted this to be something that, like, people, oh, you got to watch this talk, man. This guy is saying it. real about gun. Yeah, I just screwed that. Not going to play any of this in the workplace, I guess. Hard truth number one. I'm going to give you hard truths if you're an anti gun person and some if you're a pro gun person. Anti gun people, this recent Senate defeat was not about the NRA opposing this. Yes, that was a big part of it. But the NRA is not the political force that everyone makes them out to be. Most gun owners I know nowadays aren't really fans of the NRA. Many are still members because they feel they have nowhere else to turn. But the Senate, the Congress, the entire legislature of this country does not live and die by the NRA. And it was not just NRA lobbyists calling senators saying, oppose this, oppose this. It was many of us calling our elected officials saying, I oppose this. I am from your district. You represent me. This does not represent me. Why? Well, there were a lot of problems with this law. There were a lot of problems with many of the proposals, and there's nothing wrong with saying, I like the idea of fixing, but I, you can't just ram through something that was very hastily written, in my opinion, very badly written, and didn't reflect what, what it could have been. So hard truth number one, it was not just the NRA. It was average Americans, average gun owners were people who were opposed to this recent legislation. And not because we oppose universal background checks and a lot of other things. Don't confuse the initiative with what was actually in black and white. The actual bill as it was written was bad for a number of reasons. Hard truth for all the gun folk. This defeat that we were happy, many of us were happy to see in the Senate chamber, is bad for us because it is going to galvanize anti-gun sentiment. And it's not just from the halls of power in Washington. There are a lot of people out there who feel that this was simply a case of super level-headed measure that no one could ever oppose went down in flames. And they're going to use this to paint a lot of people in Congress and in the Senate as, you know, pro-gun zealots. And, oh, we have to throw these people out. We shall remember come election day. That's a problem. That's something we're going to have to, if you want to get involved, as I say, get involved talking to people on other sides of this issue, you got to have an answer for this you got to be able to say, I didn't oppose this and I'm glad it failed for these reasons. And immediately follow it up with, this is what we can do. Well, think about some of the things we can do. If you want to really understand what this problem was about, if you want to understand the biggest problem that we can address in this country, again, talking about reaching out across to other people with whom you might not agree, Try to look up and find this film, the film Living for 32, the Virginia Tech shooting aftermath film. A lot of it you won't like. There were parts of it I just didn't like. There's a lot of just sort of broad brush anti-gun sentiment. But, you, you know, it's a very emotional story. It's a very powerful story. I'll give everyone a pass on that, the people behind this, because they highlighted in a way I had never seen the quote-unquote background check problem. And of course, yes, it was portrayed in a very, a very loaded manner. But as much as you may disagree with the filmmakers' techniques, we're talking hidden cameras at gun shops and gun shows where people are just lying, just saying, I would like to buy this. All right, how much is it? Oh, I lost my ID. It's not from, I'm actually, yeah, I'm 18. 
literally, this is a minority of the gun sales, a very small, small segment of any gun sales in this country. But footage like this, understanding that this is what people are seeing when they go home and write to their congressman and say, oh my God, fix this problem. Creating a system where someone with no ID, with no any kind of record can walk in, give cash to someone, and walk out with a firearm is, I would posit, a worthy cause to think about addressing. And if you actually watch Living for 32 and see how, I would even say, bad it is at times, you will understand what we could do. Another point, yes. Uh, just a question, but from mm-hmm. all of my experiences mm-hmm. in this, and I, and I also follow the statistics, um, and know the math, but do those stats, mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Very minuscule. Oh, yeah. So these hundreds or thousands of problems, I'm not saying they aren't problems, but they're statistically all, you know, you're basically, the fix isn't that big. Mm-hmm. That's what I love. The fix is so small, it's a minuscule thing to do. And if, I hope, the next few slides about privacy getting involved, if you do it right, it completely steals the thunder of the rest of the argument. And that's what I'm hoping. I got it kind of kicking around my head, and hopefully we'll, we'll get to this. One more, I got to drop another bit of hard truth on any, you know, non-gun folk. Gun bans are complete fucking poison to anything you ever want to accomplish legislatively. A lot of people didn't, like, why in the shit was that even on the table in this debate? And you hear, talk to, like, there's Senate aides and people who are in these offices who've been leaking to the press a little, like, our strategy was to ask for a lot, but compromise to a little... I, anyone could have told them that would never work. All you're going to do if you try to ban literally the most popular rifle in America, you are going to get a thousands and thousands of people up in arms and hating anything else you have to say. Up in arms. Up in arms. Ah, very punny, Adrian. Literally, that's, that's my little nugget for, you know, another hard truth for the anti-gunners. If you try to put a gun ban of any kind into anything you are proposing you have completely de- just delivered it dead right there in the room. Nothing is going to happen. Please understand that. You've burned all your political capital on nothing. Especially, you know, assault weapons bills. I understand there's a lot of strong sentiment because they look so scary. They are, as Nightshade and others will tell you if you run the numbers, they are the smallest percentage of any kind of crime. I really, and this is me, I'm literally giving advice right now to the anti-gun crowd, and you're not throwing tomatoes at me, so that's progress. Not just assault, long guns in general. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very, yes, question. I say, I personally agree with being with all guns in the world from everybody that way, because I'm a larger physical guy, <laughs> and I'm back fooling everything. Okay. I'm all for no more guns, that way big guys like me can... Right on, man. But right, I mean, if, you're, if you are talking, you know, outright banning or confiscating, I don't like this... Anti-gunners, you have, you origi- you've just become the crazy person in your circle. We pro-gunners, we have a lot of crazy people on our side of the fence. You just became the crazy person in your camp. If you do want, as an anti-gunner, to see your legislation move forward, please do anything that will make my life easier as a legal gun owner. There were amendments being offered in the latest round of legislation that would have done that. They would have added more reciprocity for concealed carry. They would have made traveling with firearms a lot safer. By the way, please put civil penalties in these laws if you're, gonna, if you're actually going to get serious about protecting law, law-abiding gun owners. Put civil penalties in the statute. If someone, how, how many people have ever heard stories about flying through New York with a gun? Very few. You're not East Coasters. We live, I live in Philadelphia. Look up, Google that. Google New York Airport gun. They will not be stories of some crazy person who pulled a gun. They will be story after story after story of law-abiding citizens being detained, arrested, confiscated their, their things. 
all because the law says it's completely legal to travel through, but because there's no civil penalty, there's no redress in the courts, small pockets of the country keep screwing around with people because there's nothing to stop them. You want to pass an anti-gun law? Hang amendments on it that say concealed carry permits have full reciprocity around the country. Hang an amendment on it that says the Firearm Owners Protection Act, interstate travel, is ironclad. You cannot fuck with it. I will stand up and support half the shit you may have to say if you give me amendments like that. Now the big one. Yes, in the back first. When you say reciprocity, yes. there's a couple actual meanings of that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But a state such as Illinois or New York that doesn't allow concealed carry except for what they consider appropriate personal mm-hmm. reasons or whatever, you will want to allow the people from Tennessee or Ohio or wherever to be able to concealed carry in those states that don't want concealed carry? The question was what level of reciprocity do I feel uh, I would support? I would support a level of reciprocity whereby if my state has similar checks in place, not similar restrictions on shall issue, may issue, but if my state says you have to be non-criminal, you have to have a, let's say a training class, for example, which is, that's one of my permits is Florida, you have to have a live fire training class, then my permit would automatically be honored in any other state that has those same requirements. Yes, question. Yes. Um, what about state rights? Mm-hmm. I mean, you are therefore deciding that Tennessee or Ohio's rights have... Ooh, a lot of hands. No, that's all right. That's all right. This is, we have a lot of extra time, so we can talk about all this. So they, what about states' rights? The state has the right, in my opinion, to change their qualifying... Um, They're qualifying levels, whether you can have a class, have a check, have a this, have a that. The only thing you're revoking is the state's right to arbitrarily deny someone for no for no describable reason. It's the shall issue versus may issue problem. But maybe maybe Nightshade has more to say. That was the second hand was saying this. Oh, the, the full, that's true, not marriage. But the full faith and credit argument is the other side of that, of course. So if you get a driver's license in one state, it is now, of course, this only applies because every state has more or less the same qualifications for getting a driver's license. The problem with a lot of concealed carry permits is that the, the qualifying you know, grounds are very different from state to state. And that's something that's hard to get past. Yes, over here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there is some variability from driving privilege from state to state and from gun And that's why this is not an easy system. I would honestly posit that if you had legislation roll through that made instant reciprocity across all state lines, you would see a lot of state legislatures spending much more time on this issue trying to normalize and fix a lot of their broken concealed carry laws in all the different states. The, the patchwork blanket would become much more tightly sewn, as you were, once you were trying to cover everyone with the same blanket. But that's the best, the best kind of answer I can give. Now, here's the point that I got very interested in thinking about, though. If you want to see, quote unquote, universal background checks for all firearm transfers, someone said to me, and this was the real thing on Twitter, they said, would you support any kind of, how do you not support background checks? And I put on my, like, you know, computer hat, my hacker hat, my, how do you build a system that can't be gamed? It's like, it's like the Bitcoin argument, right? You put enough smart people behind something, it might not be flawless in its execution, but you're going to get a really interesting framework of privacy enhancement written into the system if you build it from the ground up. So first of all, do you know what the actual current NIC system is? Do you know how it works? Are you aware, for example, that it's not free? That NICS, de- you know, anyone who calls into the NICS system, which by the way isn't any one of us, you have to be a dealer, you have to be a licensed dealer, 
They have to pay every time they make a call, and it is a phone-based call, which has limits. How many of you have been in a gun shop recently, the past month or so? There have been hour-long waits sometimes, people just waiting for the call because the system is so overloaded. So it's not instant. It's not free. It's not open to anyone. The dealer has to give a lot of personal information about the buyer, who they are, what they're doing, basically everything that you write on the form that you have to fill out every time, you guys know that form, that all gets sent centrally. And then, after the transaction completes, the actual rest of the form that is filled out with the serial number, make, and model of what was purchased, that also gets sent off. So that is part of the registry. That is the current system in its current form. Yes? Really? That is not what my dealers told me, so. So the question of whether the serial number gets sent anywhere, that, okay, okay, okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Megalos? Actually, it should, I should be doing this. That's all right. When I was living in South Carolina, a uh, gentleman back there was ap- absolutely right. Uh, the local uh, dealer would do the forms, as you're saying. The uh, one copy of the form would stay with him, actually, in office. The serial numbers and all that stayed local. They did not propagate out past there. Some states require central registry. For Jersey, for instance, um, if you uh, want to fi- uh, purchase a firearm, registration with the state occurs simultaneously with the purchase of that weapon. So if you were to purchase that weapon, the dealer would then send it up to a state-maintained central registry. However, other states don't require that. Um, interesting side note, if you already have pre-existing weapons uh, from another state and then you move into New Jersey, registration's voluntary. That's, you know, so you don't have to, but you can. All right, interesting. I didn't know the, quite the degree to which it was a patchwork. I knew that every, just about every purchase I've ever made, the, a lot of extra detail gets sent off, which is what got me thinking about this. In my perfect world, I'm going to paint a picture, and you tell me, well, you tell me anything at all. You tell me what I haven't thought of, what I could think of. I feel like you get enough, you know, this is my RFC. You get enough comment, and maybe you build something kind of cool. In my perfect world, you go into a gun shop, gun show, face-to-face transfer, anything at all. First of all, it would be web-based. No dicking around on the phone, wondering when an operator is available. Completely free. I think this should not be something that ever involves a charge. And I think anyone at all should have the right to go into the web portal. You as a common citizen, before you even go to the gun shop, if you're like, gee, I wonder, am I going to be okay? I don't know if someone's been like, and it's like checking your credit score. You go in, you put your info in. What is the info? I think it would be partially who you are established by a government ID and also some information that is not on your government ID to avoid, well, Stolen ID is only so hard to use because of a photo, but it should be something, for instance, on the form you have to usually write your place of birth. I'd support that. So information goes in, the website just kicks back, yay or nay. That is it. How is this not fine for a background check? In my opinion, if it's a yay, hooray, the sale can proceed. If it is nay, maybe you even get a nice little error code that says why it was nay, and you can research that yourself. Yes, Bear. Obviously, the rage in Washington is the you know cutting here, cutting there, blah blah blah. So mm-hmm. Getting extra money from one pot, cutting from another, probably multiple. Yeah. My answer: How do you pay for it? However, we're currently paying for the NICS system because I know that like two dollars per call is probably not actually paying for the system. The hard part is maintaining the database 
which the law enforcement agencies are doing anyway. The $2 per phone call is, you know, maybe paying for the operators and so forth, the phone system. A web-based system is going to cost virtually nothing in comparison to a phone-based system. That's my thought. But how do you pay for it is always an important question. It's something we should always ask. Question here. Would it be centralized? The check, I think, would be centralized. But why I would never give a damn is because the last line, anything to do with the actual sale is not part of the centralized knowledge, is not part of the database. Whether a sale went through at all is, in my opinion, not the business of the background check. Hand over here. Right. Yeah, if you're worried about are you going to be in a database somewhere, check your own name, write a script, do it every day. Check it through Tor. So literally multiple IPs are checking your name every day all over the country. Just pollute the shit out of the web logs because you're not doing anything wrong. The system doesn't care. The system, in my opinion, shouldn't care. And if your state has registries, if your state has one gun a month, if your state has anything in state law, that is for your state to implement at the dealer level, in my opinion, outside of the actual universal background check system. Was there another hand, Bear? That was... I just was, um, yeah, and I, and I don't know the, I don't know the makeup of the current system. Mm-hmm. So what records would we be ideally checking? That's something that can be debated by the pro and anti camps and by a lot of people till the cows come home. And I personally wouldn't give a damn what gets checked in this kind of a system. I wouldn't care what, da- what arrest record databases, what mental commitment databases are hooked up on the back end because the system itself is only being used to establish my bona fides as a safe, non-criminal person. The system literally cannot be gamed into building a registry database, into building an ownership database. There is no data flowing in that direction. And to me, and maybe to a lot of people in this room, that's kind of the only way a lot of us trust systems. Whether you put in, this shall n- these records shall not be retained for more than two years, yeah, all right. I, I'll tell you what you do with those kind of fucking laws, right? You know how you get web logs that can't be seized? You don't fucking keep web logs. Like, that's how a lot of people run their website. How do you make a system where you can't create the registry? There is no record. Yes. Ah, how does one enforce use of the background check? Interesting question. The best example I could give would be have really strong penalties against, you know, failure to make a background check and have all these, all these resources that we're putting into, oh, how do we combat this part of gun thing? How do we combat that? Have, like, it sounds like a dick move. Have people go to gun shows. Have people do exactly what they did in that film, Living for 32. And if someone is not going to perform the check, bye-bye, there's your license. Oh, there went your license. Bye-bye. That's my thought, but Yes. And it winds up in a crime or something. Yeah. Yeah. Pe- penalties after the fact is essentially what you're saying. Hang on. I'm trying to think as far as dealing with a situation where let's say you know making making sure the seller isn't liable so like person A buys a gun on Saturday and would have passed the check on Saturday Sunday you know he does something to make him not eligible under the check system and Monday it's used in a crime so you said you know let's say the gun you know turn around and use in a crime I'm not sure how you would be able to link that to the check. Um, but then again, you know, the gun guy didn't do anything wrong if he 
passed on Saturday. Yeah, I mean, the, the current system doesn't really prevent that. You can't, you know, it's not minority report. <laughs> We're going to go one, two, and then back to bear. Behind you there? I've been thinking about the background system for a while. Mm hmm. Well, that was kind of a two-part comment, and I'll try to touch on it both really quickly. So the first half was, with so many other avenues, completely extra-legal avenues of acquiring a firearm, how much do background checks prevent? And I would actually posit that that is not a straw man statement, but essentially it's, it's kind of like the teenagers get beer argument, right? Why do we check ID in a store when you could always homebrew your own beer? And it's because... By and large, even though there are other channels for getting, you know, a tall frosty one, most people are going to go for the path of least resistance, which is walk into 7-Eleven, buy, buy a six-pack of something sleazy. The same thing with guns. If you want a gun quickly and easily, most people are not fabricating them from an 80% complete lower that they bought non-serialized and they're not making a zip gun in a shop. Most people are buying them from a conventional shop. So making a background check element part of those sales will not do everything, but I wouldn't object to the, the, to the few times that it would do something. The second point, which what I think was valid enough that I'll say it, I think it was a little facetious to say, if somebody's not qualified to own a gun, why are they out in society at all? We, we have a lot of people, come on, we have a lot of people who are ex-felons who have put in their time, now they're out paroled. I wouldn't want them possessing firearms, but I'm not gonna lock them up forever. We also have a lot of people who've been adjudicated mentally deficient. And we're not, we don't, we don't live in the 19th century anymore where asylums, do you know how many people we used to put in asylums in this country? More than we used to put in jail. Yeah, we understand a lot more about mental illness now. We have a lot more in the way of outpatient counseling and medication. So the idea that if someone isn't allowed to legally own a gun, that they're unsuitable for any interaction with society, I feel is a bit of an extreme statement. But it's, it's a fine discussion point. There was one hand and then back. Was there one there or there? Go ahead. Mm-hmm. So how to perform, you know, audits if this system isn't centrally logging the actual sales and transfers. Not my problem. That's my, it's a very, that's a facetious answer too, right? But literally that's my view of the background check system. It should be an element in a transfer. It is not part of a much larger system, which would be, in my opinion, political poison to anybody trying to implement it further. At the same time, I mean, if, I, if you're buying a gun, a person from the mm -hmm. Um, what's stopping you from, if it says nay, saying, well, maybe that just said yay, um, and saying, yeah, go ahead and, and buy it anyway. Um, the fact that you should be afraid of prosecution. You should be afraid of, A, is this somebody who is actually law enforcement going around and saying, you know, is this a problem? I bet you could have, you know, all those people in the Million Mom March, they would love to be people with hidden cameras on their own time and money documenting illegal sales and turning that evidence over to police. Also, if that person you sell to does use the gun in a crime, we have the plea bargain system in this country. They're going to immediately plea down by saying, this guy sold it to me. Right now, I will testify against him or her. And if you start getting testimony saying you did this repeatedly, you would be in fear for that. A hand in the back, you and then right next to you. And then I'll get, Bear's been waiting too. Mm-hmm. That's a neat idea. So the check results in a hash that you can keep and says, this is the actual one I checked. So you have a record of having performed the check. That's, that's a neat idea. I never thought of that. Uh, 
One sec. Go. Yeah. Keep. Yeah. Keep going. I'm just repeating for the for the folk at home. Like anyone's gonna watch this video later. Go on. Yeah. Yeah, the deterrent factor is pretty big in the the law abiding gun community, losing not just the gun sale that you wanted to make and not just the fine you'll be experiencing, but losing your collection and your future rights with guns is a pretty damn big deterrent, I would think. There was a hand there, then we're gonna work it up and around and then so Miss, did you have a hand as well? So dealers themselves are free to keep any transaction records that they want. Even a face-to-face -face sale, some people will do it without paperwork. I personally never have and never would. Uh, if I've sold anything face-to-face, -face, I feel it's very dodgy to not keep a bill of sale. Because again, if, if it comes back to me and they say, this was yours, and I say, no, it wasn't. I sold it to this person. Here's a scan of their info, blah, blah, blah. So dealers at their level are free to maintain any records. And I would support dealers maintaining their own records. The idea is that the central Fed NICS system doesn't have the record is, is the difference for me. Was there a hand on bear? So, uh, so two th I'm just thinking the mechanics of the, mm -hmm. the, the, I like the idea. Okay. So my, the first question I would have would be, are you talking about getting rid of, completely getting rid of the phone system, or, and if you are, what would be a backup system for people if either they just don't use the internet, or they don't, uh, you know, they don't, maybe they lose internet connection at the gun show, just example, just giving examples out there. What would be a backup system if you have in order to be able to get the backup show? So backup system in the event that someone doesn't use the internet or it goes down. Do you imagine a DDoS against this? I don't know. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And I don't honestly know the answer to that. But I bet a lot of people, other people are shouting about it. So just use the, so if the phone system didn't have that last element, if the phone system didn't involve sending any records after the fact, I could see that. I could see now that that's going to incorporate a cost. You're not eliminating the phone side, but maybe. But we had a couple of hands and oh, finish what you're saying. And then I love all the feedback. Is this, a, you guys don't feel that it's bad, the pace we're at? I love the feedback, so. The other, the second situation I could see is um, with the yay and the nay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and I'm thinking, I'm kind of thinking more in the extreme of the um, uh, no fly list in that example. Mm -hmm. Where, you know, if you're on the no fly list, how do you get off? How do you get off? The fly list you get no right. Mm -hmm. So like the no-fly list, what if you, st if you get a nay, what do you do? I would love it if the, the nay had an error code, some th something to the effect of you contact your state police or whatever office we designate and say, why is this this? And it helps lead them down a database path somewhere. Like a credit check, he says. Yeah, it's not a bad idea. Rogue. Yeah, to establish whether it actually was checked, the hash is part of the sales receipt. And it says no details of sale are part of the system. It doesn't matter whether it's sale or not. All that's kept on like the back end logs is, you know, mm -hmm. UUID, yay or nay. That's really, that's, yeah. The fact that how much you could apply the hash to your own record keeping for your own protection. I love that that somebody brought, that was you in the back, right? That was, that, I'm going to add that to my slides if I ever give this talk again. That's all right. We're going to have plenty of time for Q&A, too. There's, I'm going to get to you, then we'll click through a few more, and then there's not too much more. So, yes, sir. What is the current um, you know, penalty for if I'm... 
the current penalties for improper sale and the like, um, and I say this as a pro-gunner because pro-gun voices are the people who need to be saying this, the current penalties are bullshit. They're sometimes like the equivalent of paperwork, failure to file this paperwork, paperwork error. It's really, really crazy to me, and I am very much a big fan of easing gun sales. It's crazy to me that the penalties are virtually nil for giving a proper sale to someone who walks in with a cock and bull story and no ID. But maybe people disagree. I saw a couple hands. Uh, behind you and then you. The seller sharing criminal liability, I would definitely support that. I would. Maybe not full criminal liability because you didn't know if this person was just going to brandish or stick up a liquor store or actually murder someone, but I definitely feel they are more than clerically liable. Yeah, I would call it criminally negligent. You could probably be found for criminally negligent homicide if this sort of easy, perfect system, close to perfect system, existed, you failed to use it, and a person then committed a heinous crime with, with that gun you sold. Up here, there, then we're going to click again. Go ahead. Oh, so, so basically, I was going to say, in the current system, part of the reason why some of these penalties are so low is that historically there have been administrations, and I'm not going to point fingers at their names, but basically they, they use the ATF as their own, like, like they were trying to make it as difficult as possible for dealers mm -hmm. to Yeah, it, back when the ATF was not uh, being used properly, as Nightshade says, the, the lower penalties were kind of, they were basically uh, retribution in a way, right? Uh, before We're going to try to get a couple more slides in because I do want to make sure we can hit a few more points. I, I'm trying to drop these pearls and I want to make sure they're hitting on both sides of the aisle. Essentially, you don't want to be this guy. Who knows who this is, by the way? Right, Alex Jones. You want to take his thunder away. If you want to propose the quote-unquote, you know, what I would call ideal background check system, if this is actually put up in legislation, web-based, accessible to anyone, easy to do, free, no central registry, if that comes up for a vote and any senator stands up against it, any representative stands up against it, they are instantly painted with the Alex Jones brush of crazy and that is how, you, if you really support background check legislation, you write it like this, and you say anyone who doesn't you know, support it is this. And that's a shitball argument to make to such a broad brush, but it's totally viable, Accord, as long as the law specifies that this is for real transfers. This is for, I am giving up possessory interest pretty much in perpetuity. What I kind of have in gray, you can kind of see it down there, the, the 1024 rule kicked in my head. It's my first gun ever. When I was little, I got a 1022. Anybody know the Ruger 1022? Half the room did, yeah. 1024, what is that rule? In my opinion, if you're going 10 miles away from the person who originally had the gun, or you're going to be away from that person for more than 24 hours, that is a transfer. If you are borrowing it briefly and you're out in a hunting field and you're walking around or you're at this range and you're going to this range on the other side of the hill, you have it for a few hours, you have it for half a day, that's not a real transfer. If you go more than 10 miles away or you have it for more than 24 hours, you have transferred. And if it was fucking free to check and easy to check, you could have transferred it for zero dollars. And that's fine too. But yeah, as long as it's real transfers you're talking about, Anyone objecting to this, in my opinion, is basically Alex Jones at that point. Another big one. We'll get to that. You want to really, really impact gun crime if you want to save lives? Because that's what we all, at the end of the day, pro-gun, anti-gun, everyone in between, that's what we all should really be hoping for. There are real measures you can actually take. Toughen, and this sound, I sound like crusty old ex-cop angry guy listening to AM radio when I say this shit, right? Tougher penalties. <laughs> Actually toughening penalties for using a gun in a crime. Planning, going out with this gun, and I am going to rob this store. I am going to shoot this person. Premeditated actual gun crime. Like my, my home state, originally, I was from Jersey. There was, you know, use a gun in a crime, do not pass go, do not collect any but anything, you go to jail for a kind of long time. They keep upping it. You will see gun crime decrease. You will probably see, like, knife crime increase, like you'll be Britain at that point. 
but knives are a lot less lethal. You will not see as much lethality if you want to impact lethality on the streets. Toughen, again, the penalties for straw purchase. Toughen the penalties for people who are circumventing the checks if you implement good checks. You will see that impact gun crime. Big controversial one. Do you support like stop and frisk programs? Do you support police swarming of neighborhoods that are hot spots of crime? I actually do. I actually think that if you train the police property, properly and you make them understand that law-abiding, you know, actual concealed carry citizens are not the problem and those people are not subject to deep harassment, actually swarming crime hotspots does, it's shown, like read the, leg, read, read the literature about this. It doesn't make crime just move somewhere else. It actually decreases crime. We can debate that till the cows come home in a bar somewhere once I get some whiskey. Uh, please, if you are a you know, gun control person, please stop advocating buybacks. Buybacks are a big load of horse poo poo. They are, they are probably the most ineffective thing ever. They make a great photo op. If you want to be you know, Senator Feinstein and she's just okay and she's got a big pile of guns and then some asshole comes along with like a shovel and dumps him in an incinerator, that's a great photo op. Not going to deny it. You have made less than no impact at all in the gun crime in your community. People turn in guns that they don't want. People turn in broken guns. They turn in guns that they have in like their estate that they didn't know what to do with. Criminals who are planning on using a gun or even think about, oh, what if they come at me tonight and I need my gun? They are not turning in their guns. There is no criminal who really wants $200 or an Xbox or a free you know, gift certificate to the fucking mall or whatever the hell you're giving away. More than they want that heater on their side or whatever the fucking things the kids say these days. You are not getting anything off the street with gun buybacks. Please stop wasting your time. Most of all, if you want to stop crime, change the culture. America is not a more violent country than anywhere else in the developed world. We are a more lethal country. Much more of our crime, our violent crime, involves lethality because of our guns. But we are, not a, we are not a violent people. You can actually make an impact very easily by changing the culture of, oh, I've got to go out there and I've got to gun this guy down. I, I feel like kind of dirty almost putting up this URL, but some of the best learning I've done last year has been from the group called Gun Crisis. They started in my hometown. They started in Philadelphia. And now there's Gun Crisis US. And when I first went to their meetings, I thought I was going to be appalled. I thought, I was like, oh man, this is going to be fucking rich. I was ready. I had my Twitters out, man. I was ready to be like, can you believe this shit? And all I saw were civic leaders and church leaders and DAs and police and everyone from the community just standing up and saying, guns aren't the problem as much as like, I've got beef is the problem. Stop snitching is the problem. Changing the actual culture of crime and how you deal with it in your community and how you deal with reporting it, how you deal with preventing it. Changing the culture of violence is way easier than changing the culture of guns. It sounds flipped, right? But it's not. And there are some real amazing groups out there who want to talk compromise, who want to talk interesting ways to think about this. If you want to talk compromise, if you want to just sit down with pro-gun and anti-gun people together, fun thought experiments. Waiting periods. For them, against them, I don't know. It's something where you might have a chance of finding, if not common ground, interesting talking points. Here's one I never thought of till someone asked me in a bar. And I said, huh, never thought about it. They, they started going on and on about high-capacity magazines. And I said, do you understand, first of all, they're not high-capacity magazines, they're factory capacity. Like, this rifle comes with a 30-round mag. This pistol comes with a 17-round mag. And they said, well, why would you need that for carry? Couldn't you just, like, if you want to have it at home, whatever, but can't you just carry 10? And I said, you know, I can't remember the last fucking time I've carried more than 10 bullets. I don't know anyone else who carry. How, how many people do you know that carry, carry a 92F? How many people do you know that carry a Glock 17? All of us carry compacts or subcompacts, for Christ's sake. You carry more than 10 rounds in one mag? Have 13 mag. Really? Yes. Get a spare mag, sir. You can, you know, it's fine. <laughs> I mean, that's an interesting talking point. I'm not, I'm not making a joke at you, but that's an interesting talking point. If you would support maybe just 10 round mag for if you're leaving your house. 
I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm saying it's interesting to try to tackle common ground issues. The, but the, here's the one. I kind of gave you my thoughts on how to like make a, an architecture of privacy for the background check system. Here's where we need all your thoughts. Talk a lot about how you actually defeat the straw purchase en masse problem. Like the iron pipeline, the actual, I'm going to buy guns over and over and over and over and over and just sell them on the street. How do you tackle that problem in a way that doesn't impact other people's gun rights? Can you do it without central registries? Can you do it without mass gun trafficking and tracing? I don't know. I think minds that are way smarter than me need to tackle it. But this is going to get solved when you focus on the biggest problem of all in this idea of how do you tackle illegal gun trade. This gun, and actually both of them, because he's hooked. I didn't see the second one because his arm wasn't out like this. But No, this gun, these guns, every gun that ever looks like this, every gun that was an illegal gun started out as a legal gun. How do you build a system that helps cut that down? How do you build a system where legal guns don't become illegal guns? Or if they do, where are the checks? Where are the stoppages? Where are the breakpoints on that system? Hand in the back. So over 2 million felons have been like trying to purchase and got denied by the system itself that they should have known. Okay. Yes, go on. So sellers who improperly sell can still sell off the rest of their inventory as their license is in revocation or proceeding. Yeah, I mean, like, I would almost support that becoming, that's a, that's a hell of a penalty, man. That's, that, that, that's a penalty that would probably stop just about anyone, you know. Right. I'm saying you are, yeah, they are currently allowed, but I'm imagine if that were the penalty, you're, you're shut down, everything you have, goodbye. That's, aren't you? All right, we're almost on the last slide then, so yeah. Ultimately, I mean, I loved hearing all the voices today. I love talking to everyone in this room today. Not as wide a range of voices in this room as there are in the whole country. Please consider reaching out to those other voices. Like right now, if you are a pro-gun person, think about following gun crisis. You're going to get a lot of emotional chatter on your Twitter stream. Look at these photos of this awful shooting here and there. But you're going to get a few thoughts, a few pearls that you didn't think about. If you are a very strong anti-gun person, think about following the Second Amendment Foundation or the Gun Policy Group. And you're going to get a lot of like, hooray, hooray, the Senate defeated this thing that you really wanted. But you're also going to get a few points that you didn't think about. And more than anything else, just go to these meetings. Go to community events. You're not going to get run out of there on a rail when someone knows who you are. Oh, my God, you support this? You're going to get interesting conversations. And be the person who keeps showing up. Don't just be judgmental. Be there to talk with people. If we would talk more with each other and not yell at each other, there's, there's a fucking chance. Really, there is. There's a chance to make it better, and I really don't think it's actually that hard if we all speak to each other with respect. Thank you very much.